Hello and welcome to A Gentleman Talks. This is our series of one-to-one -one interviews with ladies and with gentlemen where we talk about their work, their lives and uh, their influences all within our framework of uh, our mission to make the world a more respectful, stylish and gentlemanly place. And I'm Nick Wing and today I'm delighted to have with me Peter Jung Ho Sang. Welcome Peter. Thank you very much for having me. Peter is uh, a fashion designer and a, a lecturer on fashion and uh, we're going to talk around fashion, old and new, and on into the future, I think, after some of our, our recent conversations. So I was just going to start out with a, a very basic question that brings gentlemen and fashion okay. together. Is how, how do you define a gentleman's fashion? What, what do you think encompasses that? Um, for me, gentleman's fashion is about, it's the embodiment of a lifestyle. And therefore, when you adorn certain garments, you're embodying the gentleman's way of living. Um, of course, fashion is very subjective, so how you perceive fashion as a gentleman is up to you. I think the gentleman movement is coming back and it's quite um, profound at the moment. Um, we've got a lot of young men, actually, wanting to look a little bit more refined, a little bit older. They're wearing suits, they're wearing ties, shirts. Um, and generally, they're trying to carry themselves a little bit better, which means that their clothes hang better on their bodies and so forth. And I think it's the whole notion and almost this paradigm and a shift in the way gentlemen are, or wanna be gentlemen, yeah. want to um, portray themselves to the world. So in terms of fashion, um, Again, it's about how the way you put your outfit together and it's about style and the gentleman's style is how you put all of these things together. It's interesting that, that you, what do you think it is that's making young people then actually hitch up the backs of their jeans and, uh, or, or dress, move from that yeah. into something that, that's, that we'd see as smart? What, what, okay. what makes well, them I think, take that care? Well, I th Every decade, every era has a certain look and style to it. Um, in the 90s and the early 2000s, we were very much about clothing, uh, casual clothing, mm. very much feeling relaxed and at home. But actually, we're now, well, because of the recession, we're now wanting to go into look a little bit more sharper. We, we want to look um, like we want to prove ourselves to the world almost okay. and um, do something a little bit differently as well. With the prevalence as well of London Collections Men, um, the three-day um, trade show for menswear fashion, uh -huh. um, which I think it's great that London has recognised that actually instead of being just a tag on to the end of Women's Fashion Week, it needed its own standalone Fashion Week itself. And I right. think having that in the media, in the press as well, has really encouraged gentlemen actually. There is life beyond your t shirt and your jeans. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it because obviously everyone has their dress down days. Yeah. But yeah. Um, now putting those menswear designers into the limelight that are designing a little more funky garments, um, they are portraying a particular look mm. and a look, particularly um, blazers and that whole gentlemanly outfit. I'm not necessarily even labeling it as gentlemanly, but it's a little bit more refined, it's a little bit more, you know, suited and booted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's pretty much put it into um, people's um, mindset. And obviously with programs like, um, what's it called? Mad Men. The Mad Men. Yes. Mad Men. Um, films like The Great Gatsby right. um, and with the characters they're portraying, you know, the advertising world, being suited and booted, looking sharp, talking sharply, being quite smooth and and therefore all of those characteristics are encouraging more of the gentlemanly notion and mindset, which I think it's quite, even though it's not obviously something new, it's quite refreshing to see that coming back into play and men are actually caring. Um, 
And men are actually taking care of what they buy into and really just wanted to spend time about the garments they're purchasing. Very detail oriented, which compared to the female counterparts, um, they notice the tiniest things on their garments, their blazer. Right. Uh, which as a men's wear designer means that obviously we have to take that consideration that men will be looking out for faults potentially but also the good qualities as well within a product whereas with women's fashion it's a little bit easier to get away with certain things but definitely it's those finer refinements right. in, a, in an outfit that people want, that people want and uh -huh. uh, rightly so taking the time and care and attention to putting and creating the perfect outfit. Um, it's not only just in the realm of women now spending hours and hours on their appearance, it's also the men as well. Um, and if you think about it, a lot of men have style advisors or they're seeking approvals from their friends about does this outfit look good, does it look great? They are actually almost adopting that quite egotistical yeah. <laughs> sense to their way of living and adopting fashion into their lives. How, how, how nice and how refreshing. Uh, it, it is refreshing if younger, if we're yeah. going to see younger people dressing, dressing properly and actually taking yeah. care over their, over their dress. And it's yeah. interesting, I've, I've seen it with my sons, sort of yeah. get to a, an age, 13, 14, I'm sure that there's a, a tipping point. There's a yeah. point at which they can actually just go off into yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Sweats or jeans doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, my son got a new school blazer and, and someone made it and a haircut at the same time. Yeah. Someone made a nice remark and all of a sudden he was interested because someone had taken notice of him. You know? so Absolutely. And I think it's about. Um, get him young. Exactly. They don't be noticed. Be noticed. Think it's about, you know, showing that you do actually care about how you're perceived in in the world essentially mm. and if you think about it um, I think it was Tom Ford that was saying that a gentleman should never actually be seen in shorts in public and certainly not in sweats oh, right. in, in public no, either no, you, know, you, you need to go out the house like, yeah. properly dressed yes. essentially to display yourself to the world um, so yeah I think it's a time and a place exactly, yeah, for, exactly. For, for, for everything everything like that what what what? I know that your your look and your we'll, we'll talk a bit about your your own yeah. your own fashion house. We call it a fashion house. Yeah, fashion yeah. house label fashion brand. House. But let's talk. To, let's start with, with with sort of classic. Yeah. The classics of fashion. So what what's the classic fashion? If we look back into in, into into history a little way, what's the, the classic fashion of a gentleman? I think. Um, do you know where in Tudor times it was very flamboyant? If you think about Henry VIII, it was all about showing your wealth, very ostentatious. It's all about um, being regal. Right. Um, obviously, that was of the upper nobles, but they loved their fashion. They mm. loved showing off. They were very flamboyant. Um, obviously, the kings, shall we call them subjects? So they, yeah. Obviously, they didn't have the money or the resources to be able to dress as nicely. Um, yeah, and having those periods where they did dress almost as outrageously as their female counterparts, mm -hmm. um, that was quite something. And then for some reason we kind of like lost that throughout the ages and then gentlemen's clothing became a little bit more subdued and which was affected by the wars, of course, the Great Wars. Yeah. Because um, on rations and clothing rations and so forth. Mm. But the, the, for example, the, the ideas of the Edwardians and the dandies um, coming into play, gentlemen again wanted to show, well first and foremost their class, right? fashion is a statement of okay. class, um, but again that notion of actually being able, almost like a peacock, displaying your colours, displaying your clothing, um, in terms of gentlemen's clothing, um, a lot of it was about tailoring, having a well-fitted blazer. Garments actually lasted for a long time, and as soon as you got a, a hole in your jacket, you'd mend it. You wouldn't necessarily buy something new, which I think now in today's culture, we, 
in some ways, and unfortunately, we are now in the, in the the paradigm of very fast, extremely fast fashion, yeah. where it wasn't always that in the case. Um, so yeah, they become subdued during the wars because of the rations, and again, after the war, it's about you know making yourself in the in the world again with city workers and the men adopting again their suits, really showing that they can be the breadwinners mm -hmm. with the Mad Men era, which we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and then in the 90s, the 80s and 70s, very experimental fashions came into play. Obviously we had the punks, the rockers, the mods, and right. the completely new, <coughs> and the hippies, and the new fresh take on how fashion was adopted. Um, somewhat lost its way during the 90s, I think. Um, but again, we're seeing all of these re of classic items coming back into play. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, actually. Well, I, I was, no, no, that's a, that's a great background to how we sort of, how we get yeah. to where we are today and what, what how fashion, and you, you can, I can think back and you can think of elements from all of those yeah. that, have, that have come into, into people's style. You know, people, lots of people wear hair products to make yeah. their hair look, you know, a gentleman can have his hair sort of spiked up. Yeah. You know, in a sort of what you'd think of as a punk style. Uh, you wear, we wear much louder ties these days yeah. than we ever did. That some of us do. That, uh, yeah. that that come from uh, from sort of hippie and, and flower power yeah. times, which sort yeah. of freeze people off. To do I was I was thinking specifically of what are the what what are the probably the timeless elements of a of a gentleman's wardrobe. The oh, things for that the are timeless the, elements of a gentleman's sort of wardrobe. Constant, I think you, you mentioned like, it. Then actually, classics. one of the the items <clears throat> is a tie of some sort. Whether it's a bow tie or a a classic tie. If you think about it, you don't really need a tie in your outfit, but mm. we still adorn them. Yeah. Um, especially where you're in an environment professionally, such as a, a banker or something like that, mm. where you know it kind of shows that you're dressed for the, the purpose of the job. Yeah. Even as a, as a functionality point of view, it has no function as, as a product. Right. Right. But it's still there because it represents something. It's about that, about that symbol of being a gentleman. Mm. Um, where it's done a little bit differently is, for example, the width of the ties. So um, in the 80s, we were about very fat ties. So we're having eight, nine centimeter blade widths. Yes. Now it's very, very skinny, very like skinny is almost like four centimeters, a half the width of the tie I was going in. I was, I was in an Oswald Botang the day in Saburo. And I was asking the store director um, what's their, kind of their best seller in terms of ties. And he was like mm. saying, because they, they offered the whole range of skinny and the wider ones. Right. And I was like, OK, maybe it's safer to go with the, the, skin, uh, the fatter ties. But actually, their best sellers were their skinny ties, actually. Interesting. OK. Um, so it's a classic item, but it's about how those classic items are worn and done a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, a well-fitted blazer, um, certainly when a a gentleman can afford it in his life is to have a bespoke blazer of some sort, or at least made to measure. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're a little bit more expensive, but those garments, they, they last a lifetime, essentially. Once you've bought one, yeah. you don't need to buy another one Something you again. invest in. Exactly, it's an investment right. piece. And there is a stark difference between uh, H&M, or a high street, let's not name any labels, a high right, street, yeah. <laughs> a high street um, blazer, can we cut that out? <laughs> a high street blazer, yeah. in which is an interfaced um, garment. Uh -huh. It's a very, very thin fusing, it's not meant to last. Right. It falls apart very, very easily, compared to a Savaro um, bespoke blazer, which is full horsehair canvas. Right. Um, it gives that garment that shape and it holds its retention um, even over time, because you'll find that uh, as you wear the blazer, it will lose its shape at, at a point mm. in time if it's not constructed with a full canvas, and therefore um, you start getting your shoulders dropping and so forth. Whereas, yeah. a, as a, whereas a bespoke or a made-to-measure garment certainly wouldn't do that because it's fitted to your body, moulded almost like a, like a piece of if you get a, a piece of um, bespoke footwear, you yep. do the same thing as well. Um, which means so you the next get one. what you pay for exactly really. and a good fitting mm. pair of shoes as well um, your shoes tell a lot about you I think um, I don't mean by the brand label but I mean the style and 
the way you're wearing your shoes and the, the quality of shoes. You can tell the quality of shoes from a, a mile off, whether they're just fashion shoes, right. um, purely for the aesthetic, which is nothing wrong with it, or if it, again, bespoke, um, or certainly of a higher quality. Yes. Yeah. That was made to last. Um, so yeah, shoes, ties, blazers, shirts, a cl part, a staple of the men's wardrobe, but not necessarily the all-encompassing classic pieces. Shirts in the olden days were seen as undergarments, and therefore you had re removable collars. Right. Um, so you necessarily wouldn't wash the entire shirt. You just remove the collar, because obviously the collar is the part that gets the dirtiest, the quickest. Right. So you right. buy collars, and you attach the collars onto the shirts. Um, certainly in um, the dandies from the early 1900s, they would be wearing shirts, but they wouldn't be, um, they'd be classed as undergarments as opposed to part of the main, main outfit. Right. Um, obviously now in contemporary times, the shirt is the main outfit. And quite often we lose the blazer yeah. and just wear the shirt. <coughs> um, and a good pair of, pair of fitting trousers as well. The whole outfit, basically. I'm <laughs> just going through the whole entire outfit. No, <laughs> yeah. And so if, if you look back uh, through, through, through times, what's your, what's your favourite period of, of, of fashion, if you, if you look back? Do you have one that the you pick out? favourite period? Well, I was inspired. When I started doing my own menswear designing, it was very much about um, the dandies from the early 1900s, being both quite flamboyant. Um, and I certainly reference that in my own work as well. Um, so I think that's probably my favourite period, um, pre-World War I, up until then. It's probably my favourite period of time for men's fashion. We lost that somewhat along the way. So everything, yes, yeah, so yeah, everything sort of 50s, as you say, post-war years with, with all the restrictions that, that the war imposed, everything became very sort of stayed and bland, and then in the 60s, everything sort of took off again. It took off again, but it was almost like, because um, the world had been so contained with what it could wear mm. within the, the war years, right. it kind of almost like a giant splurge of creativity and wanting to be loud and proud and in the 60s and the 70s for a gentleman. Um, Certainly with flower power shirts and the hippies, if you think about Austin Powers style dressing. Yeah. It's kind of like, very camp, but very, done in a way that's kitsch, but kitsch is so good, I suppose, in those, in the, in the, yeah. in those periods. And so, of course, men really like dressing. We had silk shirts and so forth. Um, and then going into the 80s and the 90s, we lost that for gentlemen, again. But I think, as we said previously, it's now coming back with men wanting to experiment with what they were. But no, but by far, my favourite period is actually the run up until the war years, I think. And so you, you, you set off from, uh, from the London School of Fashion and yeah. created, you've now created your own, your own brand. What, what, what set you on that path? So when I was developing Kerr, um, well, I used my MA degrees, uh, my MA degree and my BA degree, kind of just to really define my, um, my style as a designer. Um, but my background as well in terms of productions, I've worked in China, been in France, and I deal with factories all over the world. So having that experience kind of gave me the confidence to launch my own product line. Um, and certainly my advice to students these days is actually education is great within the walls of the building, but actually you don't really learn until you get out there. Right. And actually I think for every designer you really need to sit with the people that make it happen for you mm -hmm. um, as a manufacturer. Because they are the people that create products, they create, they know, they know their facilities inside out, their industry, the production industry inside out. Um, and I certainly learned that sitting in a factory in China, um, just working with the team at that, to really learn actually how the manufacturing process works. So that gave me the confidence to launch my own line. And then I developed that um, very closely with the fabric mill that I work with in England. 
Um, and I just, it just felt like a natural progression to be able to then create all of these resources around me that allowed me to then launch it onto market. Um, so that's how that came about. And tell us, you're, you're and I'm assuming that, uh, well, I can tell from your tie and your shirt yeah. that your, your own brand encompasses much of what you like about, about the Absolutely. period of fashion. So you're Absolutely. And colour. There's nothing wrong with wearing black, and of course black has its place and purpose. But for me, it's all about colour. I just love colour all over. Um, and that is reflected in my design style, which of course is some part of my personality. Um, and if you do look at the London Collections Men catwalks, there is a lot of colour on the catwalks. Men are becoming more daring with what they wear. I mean, not necessarily do the whole colourful outfit, but even if you look at your tie, for example, yeah. it is quite a bright and colourful tie. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I selected it very carefully for you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, um, so yes, yeah, so it's, it's a colourful tie. It's, just, it's that flash of colour mm. and even I'm somewhat quite flamboyant, maybe a little bit too loud in terms mm. of the, the colours that I wear on certain occasions, but even then men are now willing just to have that flash, that pop mm. of colour in their outfit. And just going back to your previous question about the classic items in a wardrobe, you could have a beautifully cut blazer in a black, grey or a, a navy, and then a, just a pop of colour in the pocket square or a tie. Mm. Just things just makes the outfit. Yeah, it makes it. Yeah, it makes it different. Makes it stand out. Yeah. You know? And so, you're looking at. Well, we've talked about this before. Your your style, you see as preppy. So d yeah. define define preppy for me and for, for people who don't preppy. Understand that. Well, the whole tagline is playfully preppy. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, preppy in the notions in terms of we think of it's a lifestyle. If we think of the American Ivy Leagues, it's very okay. much about the polo shirts, the chinos, the loafers, um, very similar to the collegiate feel mm -hmm. that we have in England with the blazers um, and so forth. And then I can like put my own twist on it with the playfulness of it right. through the colour, which was in the, in the previous question, through prints and through the way you assemble the outfit together. Right. Um, which is the playful, playfully preppy part. Right. So putting something together and it being, it being unique. And I know, you were gonna, we've talked about this before, and you mentioned yeah. earlier that you work, and it's a great, great thing, but you work with British companies yeah. for, for, for fabric. So yeah. Where, how did you how did you find them and, and what, actually, what do they bring to, to your designs? The fashion industry is actually smaller than a lot of people think, and it's a lot less glamorous as well than a lot of people think, um, especially the manufacturing side. But it was through refer actually, and it's about my own practice being developed. Um, and I visited several factories in in the UK, but um, I landed at Vanis Fabric Mill actually. Um, so Vanna Fabric Mail like, took me on um, when I was developing as a student, actually. So I've been working with them for several years now. Um, great team, great production facilities. So I work with Silk Jacquard Fabrics. Um, so that's essentially creating very luxurious fabrics that have patterns woven into them, as opposed to a, a printed fabric which is just on the surface. Right. It's actually the ability to create texture and, again, with men, they want to see texture in fabric, they want to see something unusual um, that's happening on the surface, there's finer details. And I spent several, kind of, yeah, a couple of years just developing that whole refinement process and doing something a little bit differently as well with the fabric weavers. Um, the factory itself, it's, it's over 250 years old, so as a designer it was just amazing to see how that came to life and their fabric archive is just a wealth of knowledge and creativity and production and all of this in one place that kind of set off my ideas into place and again seeing they were able to realise my vision as a designer as a printed fabric mm -hmm. as a woven fabric as a silk jacquard into that final fabric um, which you can see here that I'm wearing in a bow tie 
And so Jacquard, just explain yeah. Jacquard as a process and what, what it is that that makes that unique? Right. So, um, as such a card fabric, so it's, it's a type of woven fabric. Um, what happens is, in the olden days, you have the weaving loom, mm -hmm. and you have something called a shuttle. So you've got the big, entire big weaving machine itself, and the shuttle will go backwards and forth to create the fabric. And to get a such a card fabric, you would actually configure the machine to be able to do a certain set of um, weaves essentially so, so, if, so you might be missing out um, a warp thread or a weft thread to create the pattern on the surface of the fabric um, so that would go backwards and forwards uh -huh. and you would eventually with the configuration of what pattern a pattern card essentially what it's called the pattern, pattern card would tell you what um, where the, the threads are going and so forth and you'd end up with this beautiful fabric. Is this very old technology or are they all very sort of I have this vision of these great big cast iron machines, or is it all very modern? Um, in the factory now, actually, everything's digitised. Oh, wow. Um, so in the early days, everything was wooden. Wooden right. looms, wooden shuttles. Actually, now, they don't pass the shuttles from one side to the other, um, as they used to in the olden days. It's all digitised in terms of they put it into the computer. It then gets uh, put into the shuttles, which the shuttles are now cylinders, metal cylinders, actually. Right and they pass the threads backwards and forwards. And um, still a quite lengthy process though. Um, within uh, 45 minutes, you'll probably, depending on, again, the complexity of the fabrics, my fabrics will normally take around um, 45 minutes to create one meter of fabric. So if you think about it, that's quite a lengthy process just yeah. to get that metre of fabric yeah. and therefore higher cost, the luxurious nature of the fabric. Um, compared to, a plain woven fabric, which you may be able to weave a metre in a matter of minutes. Yes. Minutes compared to 45 minutes, it's, it's a long time. Um, but, but a real, a quality There is a quality material. element to How it. How fantastic to find someone with that technology and uh, modern uh, yeah. in, in Britain. That, that's yeah. a great... Absolutely, and when I surprise, it is a surprise. There, there, there are there are fabric, and I think that's actually that is one thing that the UK has been able to preserve. It is fabric weaving. We still do that very, very well in this country. So when you say that, it, we <laughs> sort of just throw that away. For, for most of us, we just assume that everything comes from India or China or places like that. Yeah, no a lot idea. of things do come from India and right. China, but. Um, no, fabric weaving, we've been able to preserve that, thank God, some right. element to it. So, yeah, so the factory that I use is one factory, but we have factories all over the UK. Um, in the north, we still have some um, very well prominent factories actually serve the entire world. Mm. Um, think about Holland and Sherry, for example, is one example. We have Moons. Um, what else do we have? I have quite a few, actually, I can't remember all of the names. But So, um, can you just... Can you just turn up at the factory with your, you've sat down yeah. on your drawing board, you've designed this beautiful yeah. fabric and you just turn up with that and they then turn that into into a piece of fabric. Is there anything that, any restriction or you just um, away you go? For some designers, they do do that process, but for myself, my own personal philosophy is that it's about collaboration. Right. So I work very closely with all of my factories okay. to be able to get to the final product. So when I first started my first set of fabrics, it was a very much about a discourse process. Right. So you're not asking them to do anything that either they, that they can't, that this isn't. No, I do ask. Don't get me their, wrong. I do. I do ask them. for the <laughs> impossible sometimes, as, right. as all designers do. They like to right. push push the boundaries, but it's about understanding the factory, about how can you push the boundaries, but work within the boundaries for mm -hmm. the factory to create something that's fresh and exciting. So um, quite often with the factories that I work with, they, they'll say, we can't do that. And I'm like, yes, you can do that. Just do it <laughs> this way. And I know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there, there's sometimes, there, there, are, there are times where you can absolutely not do anything because that's the capability of the machines, but quite often or not. It's about testing a new technique, it's about testing something new. Um, with fabric weaving, it might be testing a new fibre. So we can do things like 
um, blend with wool fibres. So I choose to, to work with silk, but we could use wool instead. We can use synthetic fabrics, as uh, fibre, sorry. So mix it with Lurex, uh, mix it with the fancy yarns. Mm -hmm. So we end up with something like a boucle. Um, so with it, you end up with a boucle, a fabric called a boucle. Okay, you have to explain. A that boucle to me. is um, if you think of Chanel, and if you think of the, the very classic Chanel tweeds and the boucle fabrics, that's created by using um, fancy yarns, which allows you to get that very nice, almost quite unusual texture of the surface of the fabric. You might get tufts sticking out. Okay. Um, with silk, you can use um, something called a slub silk or a slub fibre, which means it's a little bit coarser uh -huh. than your more of your processed okay. silk, um, which again gives you a lot of texture on the surface uh -huh. of the fabric, gives you something unusual Some to variations work with. In the, yeah, uh, so in the, the fabric. So the, the variations just not necessarily changing the entire manufacturing process, yeah. but, but changing things here and there in the uh -huh. fibres allows you to end up with something very unusual to work with. Um, for myself, I like to push the boundaries quite often on the patterns right. and the jacquards, um, which means we get a much nicer, much denser, much richer fabric um, to work with. Obviously, it comes at, at a price, right. but Again, it went in with something very luxurious. And by doing that, um, it allows me to communicate to my customers, actually right from the design press right down to the, the fibre level of what I've been doing. So a lot of designers, they have a overall aesthetic, but might not necessarily get concerned with where the fibres come from. Mm. Where for me, it's the opposite. And so if we look at your, yeah. your shirt, and yeah. your tie. Yeah. So you've then got you've got a, a coordinated collar and tie and yeah. the and the, the the top of the of the uh, of yeah. the pocket. When you start out, do you start out with sort of designing that all together, and or do you create the silk first and then see how it how it fits and works? Uh, design. It's a. Uh Everything just works in tandem, to be honest. Right. It's all of these, it's a myriad of all of these different ideas coming together in your mind. So when I, it does start with the, the silk fabric for me, mm -hmm. because that's the starting point. Right. And for most designers, it's actually the fabrics. Um, but I go to the, the fabric weavers with a certain look that I want to achieve, with a certain colour palette, with a certain pattern that I have in mind. We then develop that. And as they're developing the fabrics for me, in tandem, I'll be designing the collection, designing the clothing, and at some point it all just comes together. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> if it all goes correctly. Right. Um, and I'm actually a lot of designers about management. And again, what I try to instill into my design students is that actually it's great to have all of these designs, but it's not about designing for design's sake, mm. it's about designing with a strategy. It's about designing with awareness of how things get produced and how all of these things come together to create a, a product. Um, and therefore, of course, to be successful, you have to sell that product to the end consumer. Yeah. So for me, I was thinking about the customer, the fabrics, my production capabilities and my facilities that were available to me, and then making this all happen to come into the, the final product range, which I'm quite happy with. As a designer, you're always looking out for things to refine con continuously. As a designer, it's, it's almost like the designer's curse. You're never like happy with what you're designing. You want right. to move on and okay. do something again fresh. And um, But then that must be the beauty of it because it you've got, it's a seasonal thing. So you've got, if something wasn't quite right, then you'll remember that and then you move on to the next yeah, season. Don't exactly. You? It's not something you're going to be stuck with for years and years. Exactly. And design is a progression. And for example, with my students, when they come into year one, they have this whole I dream world almost of being the next Alexander McQueen, being able to design these beautiful garments that end up on the catwalk, everybody will love it and you'll make millions of pounds. Obviously that isn't the reality of it. So you do see a very, and in some students, a very big progression from the first year to the third or fourth year. and. 
as a lecturer, it's, it's a joy to see, you know, I call it the clicking point to my students. There is a clicking point at a certain, and I experience the clicking point myself mm -hmm. as a designer, and everything just clicks into place. You suddenly understand, actually, this is how products are made, this is how design works in tandem with manufacturing, with business. And, there's the, and, and customer as well. And you understand that, and then that gives you the, the, the realities of, it's not just designing beautiful clothes, it's actually no. understanding how they're made and the business side of exactly, it too. Exactly, exactly. Put that all together and you can be successful, I suspect. It's Hopefully, <laughs> for one, the students. But uh, one element. unfortunately you do get casualties along the way. Mm, People sure. drop out of, of the fashion industry because it is very fast, it is very cutthroat as well. Can't mm. lie about that. Um, mm, and if you can't hack it almost, then you do get put to one side. And that's, no, it's not just fashion, it happens in a lot of industries, yeah. but quite a lot with the fashion industry. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> well, that's, you're at the, at the leading edge of something, aren't you? So, yeah. you know, it's bound to be, it's bound to be hard. And so, and, and you've, but you've moved on through, and I, I we were talking just, just before we came in, uh, see so you've, you've moved on and had your first experience of Paris. Yes, so back How in was that? June, that was somewhat almost like dazzling to effect, but also there for business purposes. Um, my first time showing at Le Beau Ethnique 2013 on the catwalk shows there, so Kurt opened the show. Um, the reception was great, a lot of press was there, um, buyers were there, and for me it was a test to see how the Parisian market would accept my clothing because when I was designing the, the product range a lot of it was styled on the European counterparts and um, Italian men and Parisian men they're a little bit more daring with their style um, somewhat a lot more style led right I'm not to say that our, <laughs> the English gentlemen aren't stylish yep. it's just done in a different way yeah, I suppose, yes, we're sort of a bit more, or I think of a British gentleman as, the, as you said, the aspiration of a British gentleman yeah. is to have a Savile Row suit. The yeah. Savile Row suit has, you might have a nice tie and a nice, yeah. uh, a, a nice pocket square, but it's a certain type of suit. Yeah. Whereas a French or an, Ita an Italian gentleman, the, the, or a sort of gentleman, but the, the suiting yeah. is sharper. It is sharper, more, it's like a little bit chicer as well, yeah. I have to say, in, in some respects. So different sort of yeah. aspirations and you know, yeah. more open to, to other ideas than, than, uh, Absolutely. than the British gent who thinks that uh, Absolutely. Savile Row is where it's at. Absolutely. And um, yeah, and even if you look at our American counterparts, it, it's just a whole new world for them when they come to, to, to Europe to see what the men are wearing here, which is quite funny sometimes to hear their expressions about. <laughs> which of course, because I've grown up in, in Europe, then I'm used to it. But mm. then coming to, to the Americans, they're just like, why are the men dressed so so well, <laughs> essentially? And I'm just like, well, that's just our normal dress. Like, um, But yeah, so Paris was, was, was great. Um, the reception was really good. Um, and the Parisian market seemed to like it, so. Moving forward, hopefully, we'll be entering that market um, in the hopefully in the near future. Um, and a lot of Parisians were asking where could they buy the Kerr product range in Paris. Unfortunately, it's not there yet, so it was it was a test to see how they would respond to it. And okay, so you're, you're dipping a toe in the water exactly. to see how exactly how things go. But it was positive, so. Yes, hopefully that'll be. But, but this is Kerr is, is I know you you lecture at the London School of Fashion, but that's a, this isn't Kerr isn't a, this isn't a, an exercise no. uh, for you to see. This is this is a, a, a business. How how does that how's that working out for you? How is that? Is it uh, are you achieving uh, what you what you wanted absolutely. to? Absolutely. Uh, with all new brands, it takes time to develop. Um, I think a lot of designers and unfortunately um, and I've seen even this respect to myself at certain points it's that you want to be very quick because fashion is very a quick market mm. a quick industry that you want to get things bang 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 out right. of the new design but actually you know there's no harm in taking a step back and just taking things a little bit slower yeah. especially with brand building you need time there to understand how the customers are going to react right. to your designs yeah. Especially, um, well, no, I, I, can, I yeah. can imagine from a, from a business standpoint, yeah. no, 
as you say, finding the right people to, to stock your product, yeah. and then you know, it, it's a it's a two way street because you've got uh, a, a fashion, a season, a new season's Absolutely. garments coming in. You've got to find people you know and trust, yeah, uh, and build up, and not end up with vast amounts of stock. No, with your brand being marked down at the end of the season, exactly. and people see see that you want some, want to be something uh, that rushes off the shelves from the right people. Yeah. And that must take time. And a lot of it so far has been about relationship building and thankfully it's working out. So I, I do have um, physical stock as a retail store. So one of them you know, mm. Thomas Farthing. Yeah. And so they're stocking her. Um, online retailers such as KJ Beckett um, stocking the accessory lines. So it's about nurturing those relationships with certain buyers and certain people to right. be able to then help you to deliver your vision. I suppose it's a similar way as, as looking back down the production line as to how you work with, the, with yeah. the people making your fabrics, you then further up the line exactly. with the people who are going to be selling the product. Exactly. Think of that, that too. Yeah, and from a business perspective it's about looking at the value chain and who are the key points within your value chain um, and really thinking about X, Y, and Z person along the chain mm. helps you to do certain functions. Right. Um, and we don't necessarily teach that in, within fashion school, that actually it's very separate. There's a very clear line between design and business. But actually, there is a point where everything has to connect together, together um, to get along that value chain. You have to almost work it in tandem. Mm -hmm. So yes, one respect, I'm, I'm a manufacturer because I manufacture products. Yeah. But on the other side of that invisible line on the value chain, it is a retailing business. So it's almost an effect you have to get into two mind, frame, mind frames. Like, I'm a retailer, yeah. but I'm also a manufacturer. Yeah. And it's all making that all of work, work together to create but that business. That, that must be a great thing for, for your students to see, and also for, for, for the uh, college, that you're not just there teaching it, you're yeah. actually out there doing it. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and surviving and, and, and creating a brand in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, certainly for the students, they, they, they tell them funny stories about what's gone wrong. Yeah. It's just as funny telling what has gone right as well. Yeah. Um, I absolutely enjoy but it. But much better that, 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 it's, that it's you that's done it. Yeah. And that you, <laughs> yeah. you've been out into yeah. the mills and you've found the product and this is what happened. And, or this is what was good about having the stock in the right place, yeah. well, all the shirts arrived but the ties didn't, or no. Absolutely. You know, from a manufacturing standpoint. Absolutely, in terms of the anecdotes about how certain people work within, across the entire industry, yeah. so, yeah. Yes, so yes, expl knock, knock a little bit of the sheen off, the, off their, <laughs> their, their vision of what, yeah. how wonderful the fashion business yeah. is going to be. Well, it, it is a wonderful business, I'm going to know. Yeah. <laughs> so no, 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 I know, but, like, but it's like, um, it's about how you see it, I think. It's about, again, referring back to the clinking point, it's about your perception on the industry, which has to, not necessarily shift, but it's about being open and aware of what actually does happen. Got it. Now, I wanted to sort of, the, the last, we're going to move on and do the 10 questions in yeah. a minute, but I wanted, well, this is a nice place to finish this. Is, we had a conversation a little while ago about, yeah. which I was, found absolutely fascinating, about the way the, the, the fashion industry works looking forward and the yeah. way it, it, it just, the way the fashion industry decides what yeah. you and I are going to be wearing in five and ten years time. Yeah. Just, just recount a little of that, that story. Um, and how so you were talking works. about uh, trend forecasting, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, so we have um, very prominent trend forecasters in well, all over the world actually. So quite often um, they will look up to three or four seasons ahead, not just for fashion, for trends in various industries, um, but we have some prominent um, fashion ones as well. Um, so the, re the designers will, re will refer to it. Um, we have colour for colour trend forecasters, um, so which is something quite important for me because I do I use colour quite a lot, um, and they will forecast ahead. And as a designer, you not necessarily won't take everything that they say as for gold, but you will reference it and generally that is the notion of how um, trends work because they would have looked at what's happening in terms of exhibitions, um, what's happening in terms of politics and any legal systems that have come into place, laws and so forth, which will affect the industry as a whole. Um, things like ha that ha natural disasters that happen in the world, events and so forth. and 
that all get forecasted into hopefully what? No, they don't always necessarily get it right, obviously, but. I, was just, I just found possible. it so extraordinary that sort of three, four years hence, people, someone is sitting down in, in somewhere off in the, in the most fashionable parts of the world, the real out there places yeah. in the world, and actually gathering all that information and putting it all together and feeding yeah. it back into one central point where someone yeah. then sits yeah. and sort of puts it all together and says, yeah. in four years' time you'll be wearing brown or, yeah. you know, Exactly, exactly. Hopefully not, but... Um, well, brown is... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, brown is a colour, isn't it? Yeah, so. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. We want something a little more flamboyant Yeah, a little than that, more flamboyant. But, but this, you know, next year's going to be a blue year, or you know, the year after that's going to be a yellow year, and where that all comes from, it's just extraordinary yeah, that, it's, that it's all gathered together yeah, in that way. And there's such an industry of forecasting, yeah. I have no idea. And big brands, they spend a lot of money into research and development. So right. it's about sending those teams out to certain areas of the world to really immerse themselves in a, on a particular subculture or a culture in general. Yeah. Um, to be able to feed that back and have that infused into their next collection or their next branding marketing campaign um, so that it's relevant to whoever you're targeting. Interesting. And we were talking about that, at the time we were talking about it, that we were talking about uh, the article I, we did together for uh, about the Great Gatsby. Yeah. So let, let's just close on that. How did, what, what was the Great Gatsby effect? Did, did the, the film bring a sudden change or a major change or is it going to have an influence, do you think? Um, well, that, the Great Gatsby, I think it's been and gonna think people are now sick, <laughs> sick to death of it. <laughs> that was. Um, but uh, but in terms of trend so. from in terms of trend forecasting, yeah. it was forecasted for two thousand and twelve. So the film got delayed. Right. The release got delayed. So everybody was forecasting the Great Gatsby look will be for two thousand and twelve. But actually, in effect, it got delayed, and therefore. Right. So, so the impact was sort of spread over spread a longer period. So we didn't really long. notice it. We did notice Maybe. it because it was such. A, uh, a well talked about film uh -huh. um, and therefore we did have it there quite prominent Brooks Brothers they did all of the the costumes for the, the film right. so obviously they had all of their window displays changing to the Great Gatsby mm -hmm. um, but I think you know it's been positive though because I think again the Great Gatsby has been one of those films where it's putting that awareness back into the gentleman lifestyle That's people were dressing sharper Exactly. Being smart rather than just slovenly and you know, exactly, and I'm sure there are a lot of again. men out there that want to be Leo, Leo uh, DiCaprio. Yeah, I oh, know. I'm absolutely sure. Well, I hope there are. Yeah. And I hope that that, that all those men out there find their way <laughs> to you and uh, and to Kerr and continue to make you successful. Yeah. That's been wonderful, Peter. We'll move on now okay. to the uh, to the ten questions. Ten questions. Yeah. Perfect. So now we're going to move on to the, uh, the, the standard, the perfect gentleman's 10 questions, Peter. Here we go. Yep. So what is it that makes or embodies a, a gentleman for you? Um, for me, it's a lifestyle. It's about um, a notion of paradigm. So we're thinking about grooming, your etiquette, the way you hold yourself. All of that encom encompasses a gentleman for me. Altogether. Yeah. What's the most romantic thing you've ever done? Well, being a designer and a maker, um, I like to make things for people. So quite often I'll make quirky little t-shirts or whatever. That means something to the person that only, it's quite, it's quite um, esoteric to them. Wonderful. Yeah, and, and using your own skills yeah. and that making something so fantastic. If you could bring one gentlemanly trait into business, into fashion business, what would that be? is to always keep your cool. The amount of times I've seen business people just start shouting whatever, it's so not gentlemanly, like, you're not there to be shouted at as a businessman, so, that's, keep yeah, calm. definitely, exactly. <laughs> what element of grooming is most important to you? Um, dressing yourself properly. You know how to, you know how to do your tie, basically. Okay. Um. I <laughs> Okay, who do you think of as an iconic gentleman? Iconic, I'm gonna say something that's a little more contemporary, something like James Franco for me. 
at the moment is because I'm all about the modern day dandy. Uh -huh. That is somebody that I see as the as a modern day dandy, as a modern gentleman, James Franco. Excellent. What's the most important item in your wardrobe as a, as a gentleman? The most important item is blazer because the blazer, as soon as you put it on, you could be wearing jeans, t-shirt, but as soon as you put your blazer on, you know, you're dressed. Right. Basically. Makes a difference. Yeah. What should the, why should there be more gentlemen in the world? I don't think we lack gentlemen. I think we need to, um, because the gentlemen are there, they just need to express themselves as gentlemen. Interesting. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. Yeah. Um, because they have it in them, they just need to become more, not necessarily become more aware, but just have that, that ability to, to you know, act as a gentleman. What key skills should every young gentleman be taught? Uh, young, uh, key skills young gentlemen should be taught. Um, you know what, I don't think we teach um, men, young men at the moment, how to be how to be sh how to, have, to be chivalry basically to have chivalry um to be chivalrous shall we say and to right. have chivalry um that i think that is one element definitely yeah. yeah i think most women would agree with that <laughs> yeah. as well um what should a gentleman never be without he shouldn't be without um smelling good so he needs to be always with proper aftershave essentially okay excellent and finally Finish this sentence. A gentleman should always be able to tie a bow tie. That is my own personal mantra. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Oh, great. Well, we'll uh, maybe we'll come back to you for, for some <laughs> lessons in that because I know I know there are gentlemen who need to learn that. Peter, it's been Thank really you very excellent. Much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very Thank you. much.